Hello tankers big and small and welcome to a new tank encyclopedia voiced article covering the Panzerkampfwagen 4. Well not the entirety of the Panzerkampfwagen 4 that would be insanity to do in just one article slash video. We'll be covering the Ausführung E which is a vehicle you can also find in War Thunder and slightly in World of Tanks but which was one of the major variants of the Panzer 4 before the long 75mm gun. If you want to find out more about the previous versions of the Panzerkampfwagen 4, you can find two more videos on the Aus D and Aus B and C here on this channel, so do subscribe, like this video and go find the other videos. There's also videos covering a whole lot of other very interesting topics, so I think you're gonna love it. Without further ado, let's get into it. Following the victorious campaign in Poland, the German army requested even more Panzer IV vehicles. This would lead to the Panzer IV Aus E, which was, in essence, just a slightly improved Aus D version. By the time the production run ended in April 1941, some 200 complete vehicles were built. Following the introduction of the Panzerkampfwagen IV Ausführung D, the German army high command, the Oberkommando des Heeres, or OKH, issued orders for the development and production of the new Ausführung E version. This version was in essence just a copy of the previous one, with some minimal changes to it. One of the main changes that was originally planned was to use 50mm thick frontal armor, but this was not implemented by the time of production. In July 1939, the OKH awarded a contract for producing 223 vehicles to Krupp Grusenwerke. This contract would be reduced to 206 vehicles in March 1941. Eventually, during a production run that lasted from October 1940 to April 1941, some 200 vehicles were built. The remaining four chassis were to be converted to Bruckenlegger 4 C bridge carriers, and two were tested with a new experimental suspension. According to military historian Schermstad, some 224 Aus E vehicles were built by April 1941, but we lend more credence to the 200 number. While the Panzer IV Aus E was visually very similar to the previous built Aus D version, there were some differences. The Panzer IV Aus E's superstructure was identical to that of the previous Aus D. One of the few changes made was the introduction of a new driver pivoting visor, which would remain in use up to the end of the war. Another change was the replacement of the hinge design of the Glacis hatch doors, which increased protection. The turret design on the Aus D was also mostly unchanged in comparison to the earlier Aus D version. The Commander's cupola was redesigned and was better protected. It had five vision slits each of which was protected by two sliding armored covers. In addition, the commander's cupola was moved forward and was now located directly above the turret roof. Previously, it was slightly to the back with one part protruding from the turret rear. A further visual change was the addition of a fume ventilator, along with the removal of one and the redesigning of the other signal port's protective cap shape. From March 1941 onwards, all Aus E vehicles would be equipped with a storage bin placed on the turret's rear. This version introduced a new front drive sprocket design. In addition, the eight small road wheels received new cap covers. Besides these changes, nothing else was changed on the Panzer IV Aus E suspension and transmission. During the Polish campaign, the Germans noted that the enemy 37mm guns could effectively destroy any tank that they had in their inventory, including the Panzer IV, without much trouble. This was mainly due to the weak armor of the German vehicles at the time. Based on this experience, the Panzer IV Aus E's frontal superstructure armor was to be increased to 50mm. Since this decision was taken too late, as the Panzer IV Aus E was already under production, it was instead equipped with 30mm of face-hardened frontal armor. As a temporary solution, additionally 30mm applique armor plates were bolted on the superstructure front. 
Due to production delays, not all factory-built vehicles were equipped with this extra armor, with some receiving it later in the field. Additional 20mm of armor would also be placed on the turret front and superstructure sides on some of the LCE vehicles. The armor of the Commander Coppola was also increased to 95mm. The Panzer IV LCE also had a 50mm thick lower frontal hull plate from the beginning of production. Other than that, the remaining armor thickness values were the same as on the Panzer IV LCD. The Panzer IV Aus E was also equipped with the smoke grenade rack system, but it was protected by an armored shield. The Panzer IV Aus E had, like its predecessors, a crew of five, which included a commander, a gunner, and a loader who were positioned in the turret, and a driver and a radio operator in the hull. The main armament was also unchanged and consisted of the 7.5cm KWK 37L24 with 80 rounds of ammunition. The secondary armament consisted of two 7.92mm MG34 machine guns. The ammunition load for these two machine guns was stored in 21 belt sacks, each with 150 rounds. Vehicles that were damaged and returned from the front line for repairs were equipped with the longer KWK 40 guns. These vehicles were mostly used for crew training, but also as replacement vehicles for active frontline units. The Panzer IV Aus E performed the same fire support role as the previous version. Its short-barreled gun, despite primarily not being designed for it, still had enough firepower to pose a danger to most likely armored tanks during the first half of World War II. The Panzer IV Aus E would see action in the Balkans, Africa, and more notably in the Soviet Union. The Panzer IV Aus E would see service in the occupation of Yugoslavia and Greece in April 1941. One of the armored units allocated for this operation was the 9th Panzer Division, which had 20 Panzer IVs. On the 6th of April 1941, it engaged the defending Yugoslav forces near the Kumanovo city in Macedonia. After an initial clash, the Yugoslav anti-tank units, equipped with the excellent Czechoslovakian 47mm guns, managed to take out four German tanks, which forced the 9th Panzer Division to call in Luftwaffe support. This prompted the Yugoslav defenders to abandon their positions, and the 9th Panzer Division continued the drive towards Kumanovo and Skopje. The following day, they engaged two Yugoslav infantry regiments which lacked any anti-tank weapons and were quickly defeated. By 10th April, nearly all Yugoslav resistance in Macedonia was crushed. On the 12th of April, the Germans engaged the Allied forces in Greece. The next day, elements of the 9th Panzer Division were confronted by British cruiser Mark II tanks. In the following engagement, the British lost 8 tanks and were forced to retreat. By the end of the Balkan campaign, on 26 April, the 9th Panzer Division had lost two more Panzer IVs in combat. There were, initially, 40 Panzer IVs, of which only 10 were Aus E's, in service with the Deutsche Afrika Corps in 1941 but would see extensive action in this theatre. During 11th April 1941, elements from the 5th Panzer Regiment were attempting to storm the city of Tobruk, but lost six Panzer IVs in the process. The small number of Panzer IV Aus E's were all probably lost by the end of 1942. By the time of the German invasion of the Soviet Union, the number of Panzer IVs was increased to 517, with each Panzer Division receiving, on average, 30 vehicles. For example, the 7th Panzer Division had 30 Panzer IV tanks, including some of the Aus E version. The Panzer IV could destroy lightly armored T-26 and BT series tanks. Against the T-34 and the KV series, on the other hand, they could do little. For example, the 7th Panzer Division encountered the T-34 from the start of Operation Barbarossa, at the crossroad near Alitus, a small town in Russia. The positions of the 7th Panzer Division were attacked by a group of 44 T-34s. The Panzer IV's guns could do little to stop the Soviet tanks. Luckily for the Germans, a nearby battery of 105mm field howitzers 
helped defend their position while damaging many of the incoming Soviet tanks. In addition, the Soviet attack was poorly coordinated and the crews had very little training, which ultimately doomed the Soviet attempt to dislodge the Germans. Nevertheless, the Germans lost at least four Panzer IVs, with at least one Aus E. Another example was the 9th Panzer Division, which, after the victorious Balkan campaign, was allocated for the upcoming invasion of the Soviet Union. It was attached to the 14th Motorized Army Corps of Army Group South. On 22nd June, this division had 20 Panzer IVs in its inventory. By 11th July, it had lost 3 Panzer IVs. On 20th of July, the 9th Panzer Division participated in the encirclement of some 25 Soviet divisions of the so-called Uman Pocket. Their tanks were used to stop numerous Soviet infantry and tank counterattacks. Due to attrition and mechanical breakdowns, the number of operational Panzer IVs dropped down to only 6 vehicles by the beginning of October. Following the harsh Russian winter and the enemy counteroffensive, the division suffered further losses. During the most part of early 1942, it was subject to refitting and recovery. It would once again see action during Operation Blau, the German drive towards the Oil Ridge Caucasus and Stalingrad. When the operation began, the 9th Panzer Division still had 9 short-barreled Panzer IVs, possibly some Aus E's. By 15th July, 5 of these would be lost. The Panzer IV Aus E would remain in use up to early 1944, by which time only few had survived. The Panzer IV RC chassis would be used for a limited number of modifications, which included the Munitionsschlepper für Karl Gerät, Brückenlegger, Tauchpanzer, Troppen, Fahrschulpanzer, and to test an experimental new suspension system. An unknown number of different Panzer IV chassis, including the RC, e, were modified to be used as ammunition supply vehicles for the huge self-propelled siege mortar, codenamed Karl Gerät. For the Brückenlegger 4 C, prior to the war, the German army was interested in the idea of a bridge-carrying Panzer. During 1941, at least four Panzer IV Aus E chassis were modified for this role. An unknown number of Panzer IV Aus E's would be modified to be used as submersible tanks, Tauchpanzers, for Operation Sea Lion. These vehicles are easily identified by the added frame holder for the waterproof fabric on the front part of the turret and the whole position machine gun ball mount. These vehicles were used mostly in Russia during 1941. In early 1941, around 10 Panzer IV Aus E's were modified to be used on the North African campaign. They were modified by improving the ventilation system to cope with the high temperatures. In addition, sand filters were also added to prevent the sand getting into the engine. These vehicles were also painted with a sand color to help with the camouflage. These vehicles were given a special designation, TR, which stands for Tropen, Tropic. Two Panzer IV Aus E's would be used to test a new type of interleaved suspension. While this suspension was tested, it was not adopted. It is unclear if it did not provide enough of an improvement or if they were just meant as test vehicles for the more advanced Panther and Tiger. Not all newly produced Aus E tanks were sent to frontline units. Some were actually given to tank training schools. Some vehicles may have been returned from the frontline for repairs and were reused for this purpose as well. Today, only one Panzer IV Aus E survives. This particular vehicle can be seen at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum in Smithfield, Queensland, painted in Africa Corps colours. The Panzer IV Aus E introduced some improvements by adding a new commander's cupola, increasing the armour protection and some other minor changes. In combat, it performed the same support combat role as all other Panzer IVs of that time. Due to attrition, their numbers would dwindle during the war, but some would remain in service up to 1944. That's all for this video. Make sure to follow our website, we'll be releasing new articles on the regular.
You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or Reddit and if you use Discord there's a link to our community server in the description. Also likes, comments and subscriptions on YouTube are greatly appreciated. If you would like to help us continue to develop and expand also consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.